Have you ever wanted to use an Xbox 360 or PS3 to learn while you're playing? It's actually not that crazy of an idea. The Educational Gaming Commons is actively trying to incorporate gaming into academic learning, both by designing new games in-house and using existing ones already on the market. They're exploring all sorts of environments, some even virtual. A rundown of their current projects. As well as free educational game downloads can be found on their website. And while you're there, be sure to check out the link to their Facebook group. Um, I thought I'd start out by talking about uh, a little bit about who I am so you, so you can kind of know where I'm coming from. Uh, I do ask who I am daily because it, it seems to change all the time, but uh, the one title that's stuck uh, for many years now has been uh, Lead Instructional Designer at Penn State University. I've been here, oh, 26 years, um, and I do work at Education Technology Services, which is for follow the convoluted path. This is a unit within teaching and learning with technology at Penn State, which is in turn a division of information technology services, which services all of Penn State University. And depending on who you talk to, we have 23 or 24 campuses uh, geographically dispersed throughout Penn State. I'm at the University Park campus, which is some people would call the main campus. It, it has about 42,000 students. Um, it's pretty much smack dab in the middle of the state. Uh, next slide, please. So the question I get all the time is, well, why are you interested in this, Brett? Um, and I've been tracking games for many years, and I've always been interested in the motivational aspects of games. Uh, what is it about them that makes them so fun to use, and can we really tap into that as educators and pull either games or game-like elements in uh, to the classroom or to online situations. So you'll see on the slide there, uh, a couple years ago, I, at the, oh gee, it's been four years, um, I did give a presentation at the NMC Summer Conference, and um, a lot of my thoughts are, are really embodied in that PDF. Um, if you're interested in, in, you know, what, from an instructional design standpoint, what might be motivational about educational games, uh, I, hopefully I touch on some things that might make some sense to you there. Um, I also believe that games really hit our affect. Um, again, as an instructional designer, I look at things from the cognitive standpoint, from the psychomotor standpoint, and from the effective standpoint. And the cognitive stuff, we're, we still need to learn a lot about it, but we pretty much have some of that mapped out. Um, psychomotor skills, you know, how do you, when do you uh, turn the wrench and how hard do you turn it, that sort of thing. Again, we, we kind of have some techniques for that, but, but hitting affect is extremely difficult. Getting people to care about something, um, it's, it's extremely difficult to teach that because you can, you can you know, present it to people, but whether they're interested or not, it's extremely difficult to assess. Um, so I really think games do that in a way that no other educational media that I've seen really does. And same for virtual worlds and simulations. Um, the next thing I like to mention, uh, if you've ever read anything by Richard Bartle, who was one of the creators of the original um, text adventure game, uh, Colossal Cave, this is an older article, but I still think it's very, very true today. He he talks about what it is in uh, gaming that attracts people, and he talks about the explorers that like to go out and find every nook and cranny in the world. He talks about the achievers that that you know want to make sure that they get 100% on all the tasks and everything. He talks about the socializers that are in the game because they like the game, but but they're also there to talk to people and they really enjoy, um, you know, the the maybe the non-game aspects that the game allows them uh, to enter into. And then he talks about the killers who go in there and they they like to destroy things, other players, and you know we call them griefers today, and you even see that in Second Life where people create things that disrupt presentations and so on. And geez, I hope there's none of that here. Um, but anyway, I, I do like his, his article um, uh, quite a bit. So, and, you know, the, the, and the bottom line is why, why can't or why shouldn't education be fun? Next slide, please. So that's the gaming part of it. Virtual worlds, uh, I actually started before the gaming commons uh, came into existence. Uh, had a presence in Second Life. We're up to, oh, I think we have five or six six or 
islands or so now. We kind of have our own subcontinent. I run three of them, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We have uh, different colleges that have a couple um, uh, spaces as well. So we have some stuff going in there. But I like I like how Carl Cap has really defined some of the things uh, that go on in virtual worlds. And Carl Cap is from Bloomsburg University, and he's a really smart guy. Uh, um, his his blog is definitely very much worth reading, but he talks about this this freedom where you have flow, repetition, experimentation, and so on, and I think that's true. And if you look at all that stuff, it's all very active stuff. It's not there's it's not passive. You're actually doing stuff. Um, and I and just think that's that's true. And all the all the stuff up there you've probably heard before. Yes, you have presence and you have enrichment of experience by having a f safe place to learn and so on. I think that's all true. But uh, Carl's really into the virtual world stuff. He has books out on and so on. And, and if you've never heard of him before, he's, he's well worth uh, well worth uh, to check out. Next slide, please. Um, in simulations too, we have a number of faculty that are very interested in simulations. Um, for some of the reasons that I list there, but I also think here at Penn State, simulations are probably the, the most initially accepted form of these sorts of technologies. Uh, gaming, some of the newer faculty coming in are, yeah, they're okay with it, but, but some of them are skeptical. Virtual worlds, a lot of them don't, really don't know a lot about that or what can be done, so that's part of my mission is to, is to help show them the possibilities. Simulations, people kind of grasp that immediately. They've been around for a long time and they kind of have an idea of, of what they might do with a simulation. So, um, and again, I think that they, um, they really can be inspirational, motivational, and really good for, for task-based teaching. Next slide, please. Of course, the real reason I do this is because we get all sorts of good fringe benefits. Uh, this is a shot of my colleague Chris Stubbs uh, with the Penn State Nittany Lion, our mascot, and we're uh, actually at the Penn State Libraries for an open house session, and we set up Rock Band and a couple other things there, and we had just all sorts of student interest. They were they were in there, and we actually had them doing uh, um, some. We got a group of four that were doing. You know, they had the the microphone, they had the, both guitars, they had the trap set, and they were just going to town. It was just a really fun experience. So um, I do enjoy that. And so, uh, Alan, next slide with the video. And here's here's words of wisdom from the not too distant past. Play as advanced as you obviously are. And you still play? Yes, play, Mr. Sulu. The more complex the mind, the greater the need for the simplicity of play. Exactly, Captain. How very perceptive of you. Still play? Yes, play, Mr. Sulu. The more complex the mind, the greater the need for the simplicity of play. Exactly, Captain. How very perceptive of you. I saw that a couple years ago. Uh, it was. Uh, you know, just a Star Trek rerun, and I thought, man, they, they just really nailed it there. I think that's really interesting. Uh, and I think that uh, the use of games uh, and, and simulations of virtual worlds are only going to increase. So, you know, you can look at the Gartner groups, their, their stats and so on. And, um, you can look at what's happening with mobiles and mobile games and so on. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, what they call first season Kirk. He was, was extremely buff. Um, so, anyway... Um, I'm sorry, my phone's ringing in the background. You're probably hearing that, but I will ignore it. Um, I have no idea who it is. I never get calls. I'm getting all sorts of calls today. So anyway, a couple things I did uh, in, in the very distant past. Uh, I actually worked at the Institute for the Study of Adult Literacy here at Penn State for 11 years. And one of the things that we put together way back when was uh, a series called A Day in the Life. And A Day in the Life was a set of simulations that revolved around different um, industries such as food service, healthcare, maintenance, and retail. And the idea was to immerse these folks in an environment, a kind of you are their environment, where they would have to go around and read manuals and follow instructions and basically perform task based scenarios. Um, and at the end, they would be evaluated on what they did. Um, so, in this particular one, you're in a management scenario and uh, there's been a fire, a fire started. So 
Um, unlike in real life where you would grab the fire extinguisher out, you're, you're asked to read the manual, find out what you're supposed to do, and follow the, follow the procedures. Next screen, please. Um, following on that, we had actually worked with um, Lucent Technologies, which was part of AT&T before the mid-1990s breakup. Uh, and we also did some work with Pennsylvania Blue Shield, uh, again around these kind of task-based scenarios. And I always called them poor persons virtual reality because they were obviously 2D and, and so on. But the idea here was um, they wanted, in both cases, they wanted to promote people from within, but because they were not reading at an adequate level, they were kind of stuck in their job. So we invented these scenarios. Um, SCORE stands for Sales and Customer Service Occupational Readiness Education, which is a real mouthful. Um, but the idea was that they could come in, they could go through these scenarios, they could work in, a, in as much of a realistic environment as possible at that time. Again, this was in the early 90s. And they could, um, you know, move their literacy skills up a couple of reading levels. So people that would use this were reading at maybe the fourth grade reading level. And usually by the time they were done, this and some other materials, they were up to around a sixth or a seventh grade reading level, which is enough for them to, to move on. So that was good. Next slide. And then finally, in my other career, um, I, I do like RPG games, uh, and I've actually created a few. Uh, this particular one is was one I created about uh, Baba Yaga, and um, the the task here was you were in this remote village, and Baba Yaga, of course, who was cannibalistic, was going around eating people, and you, you had to stop her. But this was the one of the first games that I actually developed where I really got into the background literature about Baba Yaga, and I included a lot of it in the game, and I realized when I did that, and you know, enough people wrote to me and said, that was really cool, and I really enjoyed that part of the game. I realized that there was, and this was probably, hmm, Oh, 1998, maybe I did this. They realized that, or I realized that, that you could really incorporate educational aspects into games, and if you did it in a, in a very subtle way, you could really uh, you could really have some incidental learning going on, if not deliberate learning. Okay, next slide. So now we'll get to the meat of the presentation. Um, what is the Educational Gaming Commons? Well, our, our acronym is EGC. We're about two years old. Um, and our mission is a uh, very standard mission. We're supporting teaching and learning research um, in, with educational games, virtual worlds, and simulations. This whole thing started because a couple colleagues of mine started talking one day. And I said, you know, I'm working with this faculty member. and He's really interested in developing this game for whatever. And my colleague said, you know, I'm working with a faculty member, and they're also interested in, in using a simulation in the classroom. And as we got to talking, we realized that there were a lot of similarities between our stories. And we also realized that these, these, these faculty members, even though they might be in adjacent buildings, they were in different colleges. They never talked to each other. They never saw it. And, and, and they never saw each other. And there, there was really no way for them to leverage the group mind, so to speak. So I thought, wouldn't it be really great if, if there was some sort of nexus where they could come together and they could collaborate, get help if they needed? But in some cases, we might just serve as the catalyst where we would introduce people, uh, get them, you know, talking to each other, get them share, sharing stories, and then get out of the way. And all of that, all of that has happened um, with the uh, educational gaming commons. Next slide, please. So there's our goals. Um, we do want to, as I said, we want to stimulate research. And I, I always try to put that first because we are a research institution. Um, we are developing educational games. We created what, what we call an affiliate program, which was the kind of the physical implementation of how people can get in touch with each other. That hasn't worked out as well as I'd hoped because really what it turns out to be is a database where people put their contact information in and then hopefully search it and find each other and start talking to each other. That hasn't worked as well as I'd hope, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but we've also, as of fall 2009, we implemented an educational gaming commons lab, which I'll talk about in a little bit as well. Next slide, please. So who, who's involved here? Um, if you look at this, you'll be surprised when you see some of the stuff that we've done. 
by the resources that we've been able to bring to bear in terms of people. Uh, I'm on the project, I'm the manager of it, but I, only about 60% of my time. I get to do a lot of different things, um, and I could definitely spend 100% of my time on this, but uh, I'd have to give up a lot of other things that uh, I, I simply wouldn't want to because it, uh, it's great to work in an environment where I have all these diverse opportunities. Uh, Chris Stubbs is an education technologist. He works on it about 20% of the time. You saw him uh, with the guitar there a little bit ago. Elizabeth Pyatt's an instructional designer. Um, she's about 30% of the time, and um, she's really been able to bring to bear a lot of the design methodologies to what we do in terms of um, you know, establishing needs, setting up assessment procedures, and so on. And then the only person that's on full-time, and I always say poor Jason Wolf, he's our programmer, he's on 100% of the time, and he really um, he gets tasks very heavily with a lot of things that he needs to do. Something else that we've done uh, starting last summer is we started bringing in, in interns for 10 to 20 hours a week, and they you know, do various tasks. Yes, uh, Jason Wolf definitely works 150% of his time. Um, he's young, he's not married, so I get to do that to him. So next slide, please. So here's a little bit of the history. Um, and I, I saw this uh, graphic. It's actually an animated GIF on the web, and I just had to pull it down because sometimes I feel just like those cats on the roller coaster in the litter box heading down to who knows what. But uh, So we started, we formed a couple of groups, which is pretty typical, and we had a steering committee, we had a lab subcommittee, because we knew we were going to do that from the very beginning. Um, we have a community hub that, that's at gaming.psu.edu, and you'll see that a little bit. Um, and we, you know, this is pretty standard. We got the committees together. We said, "Here's what we want to do. How do we go about doing it, and so on." And you know, we worked on the the plan for actually, oh, you know, close to nine months to really get it to to the point where we really felt comfortable with it. Next slide, Alan. This is great. I still wish I had the hammer though. Uh, so we did develop the affiliate program, which turned out to be a database that was in our, our content management system that we, we use for the gaming commons, which is Drupal. Um, and like I said, we, we did establish that. Um, and we got a few people to sign up for it, but they were really reluctant to it. Um, and I think it was just the mechanics of having to go in and add all that information in and not kind of having the money in the tip jar, which in this case would be having 100 or so people already in it. Um, one of the things that we've done in the last year or so is, is really try to beef up our Facebook presence. And we seem to get a lot more traction there, not only with students, but faculty as well. So the other thing that we did is we did establish this community hub at gaming.psu.edu. You know, I welcome you to go there and check it out. Uh, it's always a work in progress, and we we'll always look at it and say, oh, we've got to redo this and everything. But it does contain uh, basic information about who we are, some of our projects, and some of the things that I've written over the years are up there, and it's also where I blog a lot about gaming at Penn State and, and other neat things that I see coming up. Next slide, please. So for the spring through the summer of 2008, we did a, you know our basic PR blitz. We said, here's who we are, here's what we're trying to do. Uh, we continue to work on the affiliate, affiliate program. We started workshops for faculty. Um, we did it one sample game, which uh, is called Eco Racer. Um, I think I have a slide on that that I'll show you in just a second. And we actually started on the physical lab design and development. Next slide, please. So here's here's a shot of Eco Racer, and. What happened with this was we had a faculty member that came to us once he heard what we were doing, and he said, you know, Brett, he says, I have this game that was developed by a student of mine. It's about 70% done, and it's in this uh, uh, game development package. And would you be interested in taking it and simply completing it? And I said, well, heck yeah. What's it about? And he said, well, it's really it's, it's a racing game, but it's really a game that's designed for environmental awareness. So you have this car, but you can switch fuel types on the fly. So you can have your, your internal combustion gas engine. You can have solar power. You can have wind power. And you can have hydrogen. And if you look on the screen there, you'll see I think, think this particular screenshot is showing that you know, there's a certain amount of wind available. It's partially cloudy out. And um, 
If it's sunny out, you switch to solar power. If it's if it's windy out, you switch to wind power. The goal of the game is not to finish the course in the least amount of time, but to finish the course relatively quickly, but with the least environmental damage. So the little daisy that you see in the upper left there, the daisy starts to wilt and things fall off the more internal combustion you use. Um, very interesting, but some of the things that we learned from this is um, even if somebody comes to you with a game that they say is 70% finished, you might want to consider um, starting from scratch again. And I think we might do an eco race or two someday and, and use a different development engine. Um, you know, other things that, that we learned with that is the idea of coming up with a client download and, and asking people to download things is it's very difficult. This game requires that. It's PC only. Uh, so there's some things on it that we just weren't satisfied with. So what we've done now is we've really gone to, um, yeah, it's, it is hard to modify an existing design. So what we've done is we, we, we've switched over to, uh, we're either using Flash now or we're using uh, PHP uh, as a back-end database that's going to HML, XML, or whatever. And we're trying to get away from any downloads or any content-specific stuff. So uh, one of the other things that I started doing around this time, is, and I'm still doing that today, is I travel all over. Uh, Pennsylvania is an interesting state to get around in. You can go east-west fairly easy and north-south fairly easy. But if you want to go on a diagonal, it gets really tough. So um, some of the campuses are four and a half to five hours away uh, driving. But I make the trip, and it's it's really, really valuable to um, uh, to talk to faculty face-to-face. -face. I just did a presentation about two weeks ago, and I was asked to do two things. It was a faculty development day. I was asked to talk about games in education. I was asked to talk about social media. There were about 40 faculty that attended this uh, all-day workshop, which was probably around 75% of the faculty at that campus. I had 28 out of 40 faculty show up for the gaming presentation. I had two show up for the social media one. So there is definitely interest. Uh, it's just a question of, of getting out and reaching the folks. And for those of you that are, that are thinking of starting an initiative like this, um, Penn State's probably bigger than the institution you're at. Maybe not. But, but the point is uh, that kind of contact, it's hard to justify when you look at a number and you say, well, I travel to this location on such and such a date. But the face-to-face -face contacts that you build through that are just extremely valuable. So next slide. And by the way, anyone has any questions or any comments, please feel free. Uh, I'll try to catch it as it scrolls by. If I miss it, I miss it. Uh, but uh, you know, we can queue them up and talk at the end. So, so what do we do? Today, here's here's kind of a, a, a snapshot of today's accomplishments. We have projects that we run. Uh, we have engagement initiatives. We have one-on-one -on -one consultations, and we do sponsor guest speakers. We also have. EGC Lab, and I'm going to show you a little bit about all those things there uh, in the following slides. Next one, please. So we do have an active Second Life presence, as I've mentioned, and this is one of the first actual engagement initiatives that we did, uh, where we invited faculty to submit a proposal with what they wanted to do in, in Second Life. Uh, uh, this is one of the best things that came out of that initiative. We built this. Actually, I built this Hacienda, and it taught me that I really am not a great Second Life builder. I, I work for probably two or three weeks at, in the evenings and build it, and it, it, I'm very proud of it, but I also realized that uh, I don't want to be a Second Life builder the rest of my life. Um, so what, sh what she's using this for is this is a, a, a faculty member at Penn State Harrisburg that uses this space for teaching Spanish uh, 1 through Spanish 3. And she's found some really, really amazing results with this, results I never would have thought of. Um, believe it or not, the student's writing uh, has become much more verbose and much more technically accurate by being immersed in this space. I, I just think it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, yes, uh, Flora Almendros is, is her Second Life screen name. Gloria Clark is a real life name. Um, and she's gone the, the very good uh, faculty route of publishing. She has a, a, a book chapter on this, on this space and what she's done with it. And she uses this space for teaching, but also as a staging ground. Her students go all over Second Life now and visit different 
different different places. Uh, they come back and talk about it. They blog about it. They take pictures and so on. Just been a very very good uh, very good experience and something that uh, you know when I was just getting in this I wasn't really sure what was going to happen. So I'm very very happy what's happened with this. And Flora has become uh, a builder and a, and a buyer of certs. I'll seed her with linden dollars once in a while and she'll go out and she's added to this space quite a bit. Um, really neat stuff. Other things that we've done in there, we have uh, the Palmer Museum exists in real life here at University Park Campus. Uh, it was uh, obviously donated by the Palmer family. And there's a number of artwork in there that um, Penn State people have permission to recreate digitally. So we've created this virtual Palmer Museum, which is adjacent to this space that you're seeing. Um, and it's just a very neat space where you can go in. It's kind of the traditional, you know, look at the picture, click on it, get a note card sort of thing. But uh, it has unique artwork in it that you won't see anywhere else in the world. So that that's kind of nice. Uh, also, I started out with Penn State Isle, then I got Penn State Isle 2, which was a scratch space for faculty. And that thing, the faculty came and they never left. So they have all sorts of things going on in Penn State Isle 2. So now I have Penn State Isle 3. Uh, yes, it is open to the public. You can get in there and, and take a look around. Uh, if you type in Penn State Isle and Second Life Search, you'll, you'll find it. Um, you can also get to it from the gaming.psu.edu. I have slurls set up for SL URLs for those of you that are, uh, don't go in world a lot. Uh, it basically, it takes you to a web page, you click on it, and it will launch Second Life and take you to that place if you want to go to it. So, yeah, check it out. Uh, it's interesting. It's kind of a it's kind of a mishmash of places now. And I always talk with my colleagues here. You know, should we have a guided tour? Should we move things around and everything? But there's so much going on in the space that we hate to disrupt anyone. So, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Penn State World Campus, which is um, most of our online offerings, I shouldn't say that, it's not true anymore, but it started out as Penn State's online presence for online learning, has an island there, and Shannon Ritter, uh, or Shannon Rakowski, I believe she is in Second Life, she just does amazing things in that space. I, I envy her because she can spend so much more time and, and do some neat things. Uh, uh, yes, we do a virtual dance or she does. I used to be involved with it, but uh, we have the Penn State Dance Marathon, uh, which is for charity every year. And a couple years ago, she started doing that in Second Life and raising Linden dollars that she would turn into real money and then donate to the cause. And uh, I think the first year we got five hundred dollars, which doesn't sound like much, but that's a lot of Linden dollars that got donated. So and everyone comes in and dances, and it's cool. So it's uh, yeah, it's a huge, huge event in, in real life. Uh, it consumes many, many students an entire year to set it up and everything. So uh, what do I do in this space? I don't do near as much as I would like, as I've said. I'm more of the land baron. I help people get their space set up. I, I seed them with linden dollars. I you know, do some humble builds, although uh, anymore I try to buy stuff or convince them to build it themselves. Uh, and I unfortunately don't teach in this space. I'd love to. And uh, maybe one of these days I can wrangle a, a, a course where I'm actually using it. Uh, so I do envy my colleagues there. Next slide, please. We also have uh, a podcast series that you're welcome to listen to. Uh, you know, when you're walking home or you're exercising or whatever. And we've tapped into a lot of the faculty that we've worked with to talk to them about what they're doing and uh, why they think this is so important. And I mention that here because I really think if you're working with administration, upper administration, sometimes you can show them the games and that's good. But if you have a faculty voice in the mix, and which podcasts are great for, and then you can get them to listen to even one of these podcasts, it can really leverage things for you in a very positive way. Uh, I've seen that happen before. I've shown people games they're not interested. I've talked to them about they're not interested. I point them to the podcast and they come back and say, you know, and then the conversations start. So I think that's really cool. Other things that we're doing, um, a lot of people come to us and say, well, do I have to build a game? And I tell them, heck no. I mean, there's a lot we can learn from games that we can turn uh, we can we can insert into activities in the classroom. You know, the five-minute games are easier to prepare and run. They don't require a lot. And so I'm getting a lot of leverage with faculty doing that by taking things about, you know, simple the, the team-based things and, you know, leaderboards and so on, which are really just token-based economies that 
you, if you're an educator, you know what that is. It's the gold star that Johnny would get when he got an A on a spelling test. Kind of the same thing, but college students like it too. So we've been getting a lot of leverage uh, in that as well. Next slide, please. So last year, we started uh, engagement initiatives for games. And we put out the RFP, and we said, well, we want to do two things. We'd like to build a humble game, because like I said, poor Jason, we don't want to kill him. Uh, and, the, and then the other thing we'd like to do is take a commercial off-the-shelf game and wrap instructional activities around it, wrap some assessment into it, and so on. Um, that did and did not work out. We got a number of proposals in, but they were all about game development. So uh, in the 11th hour, we decided we had enough resources to develop two different games. Then lo and behold, a couple of months later, a faculty member came. He said, you know, I found this old game from uh, Electronic Arts called Sim Health, and I'd really like to use it. Um, and we're like, oh, OK. Um, and, and so that is a commercial off-the-shelf game. We figured out how to get it to run. It's an old DOS-based game. Um, and we did wrap the instructional activities around it in the assessment. Uh, and it's actually turned out very well. And I'm sure some of you out there are saying, now wait a second, a game from 1992 about health care in this, in this country, how can that possibly be relevant? Well, believe it or not, most of the situations in this game are directly relevant to today's health care situation in, in America. Uh, the numbers have changed. There are a few things that aren't quite true anymore, um, but it, that also serves as, as a stepping off point and discussion point uh, for the in-class activities. So the one up here on the screen is Chem Blaster, and this was developed um, basically to teach uh, the, the faculty member we work with, she wanted to teach, I think there's 49 what she calls common elements that she thinks everyone should know. So that's that's low-level knowledge, it's kind of drill and practice. And so the, the first couple of levels in this game, that's what they do. You identify barium, you identify, um, 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 I don't think ruthenium, but you identify hydrogen and stuff like that. But the upper levels of the game is where it gets really interesting, and it's not just click and hope for the best. Uh, you actually have to correct, connect uh, elements with different ion charges together, which means you have to have some background knowledge about what's going on or you'll just fail out immediately. So that's Chem Blaster. We are in the final stages of actually testing it with students now and running some assessment to see uh, you know, if they're actually learning uh, from it, which we hope they are. I think our uh, preliminary reports are positive in that result. Um, this is a flash-based game. It does have PHP on the back end for data collection and so on. But this game and all the games that we have are going to be released under a Creative Commons license. And if you want the source code, we'll give it to you. You know, you can do whatever the heck you want with it. Uh, that's that's one of the goals that we have here is just not to build things and you know keep them to ourselves, but to, to share them. The other interesting thing about this is when we make this public, and, and those of you that uh, remember and go play it, uh, if you've ever played the game Spyro, you'll hear the background sounds are very Spyro-like. And the reason we did that was because when the faculty member came to us, she wanted us to build a Spyro-like game. And that would have been a 3D immersive moving around sort of thing. And we just said, well, we, we can't do that simply because we don't have the time or resources to do it. But what if we did this? And by the way, you know, part of the part of the great thing about Spyro is the great background music and so on. She loved the idea, and so did the students. Next slide, please. So this one is this is an older screenshot. It looks a little spiffier now, but this was the one that came into us from a faculty member at Penn State Schoolkill, which is kind of near Philadelphia. Um, and she uh, is an English professor, and of course she has students coming in, and they're making all sorts of grammatical errors, spelling errors, and so on. And she said, "Is there something we can create that might be fun that they could do in class or in the lab that would help, hopefully, improve their uh, their language skills a little bit, their written skills a little bit?" And we said, "Well, let's let's talk about it." And what we've come up with is Typo, which is a game where the um, Excuse me. The text appears on the screen, and it starts to scroll, and you have to click on the errors. Um, we have 
a development engine in the background that's just web-based forms that you fill in to put the uh, the text in to identify where the problems are and so on and try to make it as simple as possible to use so what we have here unlike chem blaster which is kind of standalone really can't modify it we have here a game shell so hopefully um, when we're finished with this project other professors around Penn State will pick it up and they can put their own text into it. Um, we're looking at maybe can we add things with chemical formulas in it that have um, you know incorrect equations and so on. See if we can't use it to do that sort of thing. So that's uh, that's the other game that we're just about ready to release. Next slide please. And the other thing that we do is we're trying to bring in guest speakers. Um, we had Again, this is something that blew me away. Uh, the the um, uh, the university relations speaker for Blizzard and Blizzard's, you know, Blizzard's the the, the game developer company. I guess you would say uh, right now they have all the big MMOs that are out there, like World of Warcraft and Starcraft and so on. Um, everyone knows everyone that plays games knows who Blizzard is, and she. Uh, she said she called us up and said I'd like to come and and you know talk and you know basically for her it's kind of a recruiting effort uh, so we said sure um, but the time window was really small we had oh just a couple of weeks to get this together so with minimal advertisement and what you're seeing on here is one of the advertisements that we posted around the university uh, uh, we took her up to the Penn State Forum, which is where the large classes are held, uh, but only a, a tiny slice. The forum's round, but it's divided up like a pie into different sections. So we had one of those pie sections, and we figured, oh boy, you know, this this room's huge, but we we'll probably get like 30 students in. Well, we had about 150 students that came to it. We had about 10 faculty, which was really great. And she gave her talk for about 45 minutes or something. But then the really amazing thing happened. About half the students stayed afterwards, came down, and hand-delivered their resume. So they're all looking for jobs at Blizzard when they get out uh, or in the gaming industry. So while Penn State, per se, does not have a gaming curriculum uh, of, of any type, the students here are definitely, definitely very interested in it. So one of the things I'm trying to do knock together an outline of what a gaming curriculum would look like at Penn State you know could we actually swing that sort of thing and, and have it as an undergraduate program that might be cross-disciplinary and, and so on uh, be a long road to haul but uh, I'm gonna keep banging away on that because I know the students are interested and that's why we're here we're really here for the students so that was just interesting to see the students with their resumes and, and so on that was that was really cool next slide I'm going to have to move a little. Yeah, well, I'm going to have to move a little quicker because we're almost out of time. So I'm going to I'm going to go quicker. Uh, that's the question. What academic department would have that degree program? I'm not sure uh, whether it would would it fit in computer science or whether it would fit in a liberal arts program. I'm I'm just not really sure. Um, so the lab it opened up in fall of um, of last year. It actually has historical interest in that it was the room where the first computer lab at Penn State was put in in 1988. Uh, so it has some, hopefully it has some positive vibes in there. It's in a freshman dorm and when it's not reserved by faculty it's an open lab for fun. It's open from 8 uh, in the morning until midnight and it's jam-packed with kids. Next slide. So we started out, here was an overhead diagram that we drew after many, many months of figuring out what we wanted to do. Next slide, please. Then we did a mock-up in Second Life. Uh, and that was really good because it let us place things, walk around, even though you know your avatar moves a little clunkier in Second Life. We figured out a few things, like we had a beaded curtain that divided the two sections of the room, and we decided to scrub that. Uh, we decided where we would place our monitors and so on. So that was really cool. Um, and I was really glad that we did that. It, it, it only took us a couple of hours to really mock it up, but it, it, it saved us days and days and days of, of development time later on. Next slide, please. So, next slide, please, Alan. There we go. Okay. Um, again, we we had a, you know the typical committee and everything. I had to work with people from all over the university to put it in. There was delay because physical plant, which does all the lab renovations, ran into some snags and so on. 
Uh, but we did it all internally at Penn State, except for the video unit that we actually hired an outside agency to come in and put that in. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. Uh, we did involve faculty and students in the design. Uh, you know, their basic thing was they said they wanted it to look dark like a cave, so we ended up with uh, dark blue on the walls and so on. Um, we also brought a sound engineer in to test the sound levels towards the end of the process because we were really worried that the sound was going to bleed over out of this room into the larger lab that it's adjacent to. But I'm happy to say that the good old concrete uh, and cement block walls hold the sound very nicely. But that was interesting. He brought a bunch of grad students in with all their test equipment and everything. And that was neat. So next space or next slide, please. So what we have is a pretty innovative space that has um, you card swipe into the room for security purposes. There's eight PCs in two groups of four. Um, we have a Wii, a, a, a PlayStation, and an Xbox. They're in locked cabinets that uh, you have to unlock by uh, typing in your Penn State Access ID and password. And there's a ceiling projector. Uh, next slide, please. We have five wall-mounted 52-inch uh, LCD panels. Um, and the video switch unit, which is this monster in this room, I had no idea it would be this big, but basically what that lets you do is uh, choose any uh, output um, from any of the uh, consoles or any of the PCs and then pump the video and audio out to any of the LCDs or the overhead projector or the ceiling projector in the room. Pretty cool stuff. We have wireless in the room and we also put five mobility ports in for the heavy duty gamers that for whom a wireless connection is not good enough, they can actually plug in and get a wired connection to the internet. Next slide. This is probably the main sticking point in the lab. This box, uh, those boxes actually contain eight DVD drives that are hooked up to the PCs because we're trying to run the commercial games and th that require a CD on startup. Um, and it's just a real pain. Uh, the PCs are having a difficult time handling the eight DVD drives that get mixed up and so on. Um, but the slot that you're seeing in there, uh, we originally didn't have that, and I'd just like to mention that because what happened when we were testing it, somebody actually ejected the, the CD through software instead of pushing the button on the drive. And of course the drive door popped open and got stuck and then you couldn't use that particular game. So those slots are in there so you stick a pencil in through the door and, and shut the drive. <laughs> Pretty funny stuff. Next slide. So I mentioned we do have the card swipe and the security, and that gives us enough uh, security between that and the sign-in on the on the lab p on the PCs or the sign-in for the consoles. Believe it or not, the only thing that we've lost in the lab to date is a scratch manual. You know uh, that we printed out and we're, it was laying around and somebody stole it. Big deal. So we're really happy. We're really worried stuff would be stolen, and it really hasn't been. Uh, next slide, please. There's the just the PCs. Uh, next slide, please. I know we're almost out of time here. Um, that's the actual uh, custom-built console access. So you come in here, you say, I want to play on the Wii. You type in your Penn State Access ID and password. The doors on the cabinet open up, and then the, 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 the console is accessible at that point. Uh, what that means is you're responsible for the, for the contents of that cabinet until those doors are shut and you're logged out of the system. Um, Kids have been great. They haven't they haven't tried to steal anything. Next slide. That's just the inside of what one of those cabinets look like, and I show that one because it's a mess. Uh, but you can see that's the Wii one with the the Wii motes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we have all those uh, consoles hooked up to a Cisco firewall with a couple ports blocked and satisfied our security office so that they knew if somebody were to send a death threat out through one of these consoles, we could track who it was. So. Next slide. Um, this is our, our video switch system. You'll see on the left there you choose your source, and on the right you just choose your output, and it magically happens. Just a great piece of technology. Next slide. That's a shot of the lab that uh, where the students are in. You'll see that there's both beanbag chairs and just regular chairs. Um, next slide. And keep going, Alan. That's just going into the lab. And then one more slide here. Um, well, that's interesting. OK. Go, oh, go one more, Alan. There we go. OK. Um, 
Nope. Yep, that's the one. That's one. That's uh, that. The whiteboard was in there originally, and we just left it in there. And it's been a great source of communication. Kids write on it and tell us what they want, what's broken, even though you know we tell them that, that there's signs of where they can email us and tell us stuff. Um, but it's, I go down in there at least once a week to just to check and see what they're asking for. And sometimes I can do it. Sometimes I can't. So um, since we're out of time, I'm going to stop and I'll just say, are there any questions and so on? What's been some well, of the uh, feet? What, what are some things you're hearing from students as far as the way they're using the, the game lab? Um, students, since it's, since it's an open lab when it's not reserved, students will come in there between classes just to play games. Some of them will actually bring fly, uh, you know uh, USB sticks in, and they'll save their game off onto that so they can play from session to session. Um, so the students are using it in that way. Some gaming clubs are, are reserving the lab and using it for that. They're using it for uh, charity and so on. Um, so that's what's going on with the students. When we develop games for a faculty, are you favoring any particular gaming engine like Unity 3D? No, like I said, at this point we're, we're really focusing on Flash and um, either, either Flash with PHP as a back end or um, HTML, XML uh, being pushed out through, uh, through PHP and so on. That's pretty much what we focused on to this point. Um, faculty use, uh, faculty are reserving it and they're actually doing research projects in it. Um, we have a, a faculty member here, Steve Thorne, who's looking at language acquisition via World of Warcraft. That's, a, that's an ongoing project. We have a grad student that is looking at one of the Star Wars game and seeing if the tactics and strategies you develop there translate over to the subjects, which are in this case are ROTC students. So he's just getting into that. Yeah, Steve. Steve's an amazing guy. And I think there was a, well, time for one more. Um, Bernadette kind of hinted at an issue I remember you talking about is um, dealing with the licensing for that kind of setup. Um, yeah, so the CD or DVD ROMs that we have, that's no problem because, you know, we're, we have one one per station. We also use um, um, Steam, which is kind of like, it's by Valve Software, it's kind of like iTunes for games. So you install the Steam client on, on the PCs, and then you can download Valve Software games like Half-Life, Half-Life 2, and so on. We also, uh, for the whopping price of $10 a seat per year, we've invested in their Source U program, which, are, which is their educational outreach. So for $10 a year, we get all those games, uh, and we also get access to some of the older games source codes for students. Um, great thing to look into, and I hope it's the wave of the future in terms of the way games are delivered because the physical media in a lab just doesn't work. All right, Brett. Well, I, I really want to thank you for bringing us the the broad uh, landscape of gaming that's going on at, at Penn State. It's it's great. And what uh, what's going there, and especially when you consider that you're doing it across all those campuses. Yeah, I and mean, thank you, thank you for having me. I'm sorry I went over a little bit. That's okay. We're flexible here, um, and I'm sure you might have some more questions for Brett. So um, find the uh, Nittany Lion uh, when you get a chance to ask him questions. And we, we do have about uh, ten minutes before uh, the last session of the symposium coming up. And we're going to have Tom Caswell and Marion Jensen uh, down on the floor here to talk to us about Twistery. And we'll be starting up in a few minutes. Um, if uh, Tom and Marion are here, maybe we'll do a little sound check. Okay, thanks all.